In Charles Dickens' famous story, A Christmas Carol, Jacob Marley's ghost comes back to warn the stingy Scrooge to change his ways. It makes for a very heartwarming tale, but in the real world, the dead are never heard from again. Or are they? Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, Dr. J. Vernon McGee answers the important question, can the dead communicate with the living? We're in 1 Samuel chapters 27 and 28. David is in a dark valley and Saul's on a desperate journey to visit the witch of Endor. For David, brighter days are coming, but Saul, sadly, is about to enter the realm of dark, evil spirits never to return. So grab your Bible and find your spot while Greg and I have just a minute to tell you about a new resource that I think you're really going to like. Yeah, Steve, one of the things uh, we try to do is listen to our listeners. <laughs> when you talk to us, we listen. And one of the things for a long time many of you have asked for is a tool that would make it easy to share how to listen to Through the Bible. And we've got something today to describe to you. We can't show it to you. Uh, but we think this is going to help you as you reach out and try to invite more people on the Bible bus. Yeah, and we've done a kind of a riff when you're on a bus. You yeah. need a pass yeah. if, or you're going to have to pay. So we have a Bible bus. Bus pass, and it's an all-access pass, by the That's way. That's right. Only you don't have to pay. That's right. You can easily listen. You can hand it to someone real quickly, and there's a little QR code on the back. There's also the straight URL address if they want to go the old-fashioned way. But right. they can just hit it with their usually their camera on their phone, yep. and it's right. going to take you right to a site that is a TTB through the Bible site that has all the different ways you can listen to this ministry. Yeah, it's really brilliant. And of course, what we want to emphasize is. Give it away. This is for you to give to other people. It, use it as a ministry tool. And if you'd like a pack of 10, give us a call or send us an email. We'll send them to you at no charge because we want this to be a ministry. Yeah, and we've also got some other ideas on how we're going to utilize this concept based on how well it's received. So yes. if you if this is something you think that you can use in your uh, just practical ministry among uh, non-believing and believing friends, then go ahead and check it out and use it. And one of the neat elements of this, you mentioned a QR code. Not everybody hearing our voices is going to know what that is. But during COVID, QR codes became very significant because you would go into a restaurant and they would say, well, we don't want to hand you a paper menu or a plastic menu. Just use your camera to use a QR code to open the menu up. So people got a lot more familiar with it during COVID. Yeah. Well, we're excited about this. Get in touch with us. Give these out and let's bless some people. Sounds good. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin our study? Father, I'm grateful that we have a listening family that wants to reach out, that wants to invite people to get into your word, to join us on the Bible bus. I pray that this small effort of ours would result in many people being saved, Christians being strengthened, and lives being changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now friends, we continue to follow Saul and David. We're coming actually to the end of Saul's life, and we followed David in the 27th chapter, and then in the 28th chapter, we'll look at this visit of Saul to the witch of Endor. Now, if you'll notice here in chapter 27, we find that David's heart is becoming weary with this continual running away and hiding in the dens of the earth. This chapter opens with, and David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. Now, this obviously is a departure of David from that high plain of faith in God that he manifests in his life. This is a period of just letting down. We find that this same thing happened to Abraham. It happened to Isaac. It happened to Jacob. The fact of the matter is, it seems to have come in the lives of most of God's men. And it has a real message for you and me today. I'm sure that we're speaking today to some weary soul. You are faced with problems. You've been in the darkness maybe a long time. You've been down in the valley, and you're just wondering if you'll ever come through or not. And you, like David, you despair, actually, that there'll ever be a solution to your problem. 
and you go through that period. Well, if it's any comfort, there are others that have been down through the same valley as you've been and over the same route. It's a well-worn route. And here is a man that took that route long before you and I got here. And I'm sure most of us have been over it. It's one of the reasons David has been such a help to me in my own Christian life is because of an experience that he has like this. And you can certainly sympathize with him. It looks like the poor man may spend the rest of his life. And he's had several narrow escapes. And one of these days, he could be slain. And he's wondering about it all. And I'm sure that today there are those that despair and feel like giving up. Well, what happened was, and I'm not going into detail here, other than to just read verse 2 where it says, And David arose and passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And he dwelt in Gath here, and he took these two wives. We're going to have occasion to talk about this in the life of David later on. But let me just pass by it at this time and say, this man, discouraged, despondent, and down, he does something he should not have done. He leaves the land and goes into the land of the Philistines, and it actually, as we're going to see, gets him into trouble. And we find him now among the enemies of God. Here in chapter 28, it says, It came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy man. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know that thy servant can do. And he says that I'll make thee the keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. Now we have the visit of Saul to the witch of Endor. I'm reading verse 5. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now God is not speaking to this man at all. Let's put this down at this particular point. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and diligently inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Endor means ventriloquist. She was a ventriloquist. And I think that she was partly a phony and partly given over to spiritism. Now, let me dwell on this for just a moment. You and I are living in a day of frills and thrills in religion. And one of the avenues which thrill seekers are exploring is modern spiritism, or ancient necromancy. And, of course, the strongest argument they have is the witch of Endor. They say, well, she brought up Samuel. And the question is, did Samuel come back from the dead to communicate with Saul? If so, of course, it's the only instance recorded in Scripture. Now, before answering this question, I want you to look at some material that's in the background here that's important for us to see. Scripture positively condemns the practice of necromancy. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, 
or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination under the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto the observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Now, you and I are living in a day when we find that there's a great deal of practice in this connection. Out in Hollywood, there are two that were listed several years ago in Time magazine. These two necromancers are fortune tellers, and most of the Hollywood stars consulted them according to the article in Time magazine. May I say to you that right now we're seeing a revival of that, and it's been going on a long time. Back in 1947, The Guardian, a publication of the Church of England, had this article. It says, in spite of the large amount of fraud, fake, deceit, and thought reading, conscious or unconscious, that the investigator of psychic research has to contend with, there remains a nucleus of genuine matter that cannot be explained with our present knowledge except by accepting the hypothesis that human personalities exist through death and that certain persons have the power and gift of contacting them. Churches have nothing to fear from genuine psychic phenomena. May I say to you, that is amazing, because since then there has been growing this matter of looking at the stars. There has been growing this so-called science of ESP, and I can't go into a great deal of detail in a study like this, but a great many people today are studying the stars. They go and buy a horoscope and literally millions of dollars today are being spent. And according to that article that was in Time magazine several years ago, probably the astrologers are taking in several million dollars a year and that there are some 5,000 full-time astrologers and about 100,000 part-timers who collect an estimated $100 million a year from more than 10 million believers, and most of them are female. That's what the article says. Now, may I say to you that the Word of God absolutely condemns this sort of thing, and God has judged nations in the past because of it, and he even put his own people out of the land from turning from him to these different ones. My friend, this is one of the dangerous practices of the hour. Scripture warns of this practice and predicts that there'd be an outbreak of it, by the way. You find in the account of Lazarus, the beggar and the rich man, the rich man was strictly forbidden to return to the living. He's told he couldn't. Paul was caught up to heaven and silenced. He couldn't even tell what he had seen at all. And listen to what the Word of God says. Matthew 24, 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs, false prophets. They'll show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And Paul in 2 Thessalonians says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. And Paul writing to a young preacher says in 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And we have on the West Coast several churches, they call them churches, Churches where they're called Satan churches. They worship Satan actually. And this is something the Word of God says will increase in the last days. And this is something that this man, Saul, now is going to this witch of Endor. Now will you notice, Saul disguised himself, and I'm reading verse 8, 
put on other raiment. He went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest that Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid. For what sowest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he's covered with a mantle. Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me that I shall do. Well, friends, it's obvious from this that God's not in this. God would not call him up to begin with, but Saul makes it clear God was no longer speaking to him at all. Now, in Scripture, we need to understand that only Christ ever communicated with the dead. You will recognize that he spoke, and he alone can speak to the dead. And this man Saul was abandoned of God. Heaven is silent, and so Saul turns to hell. Now, did Samuel appear to Saul? There have been several explanations that have been offered. There are those that dismiss this as a fraud, that the entire incident, that nothing was genuine. She was a ventriloquist. She could have put on all of this, but I think she was as frightened as Saul was at what happened. I think she was a fraud. Houdini in his day, said he could duplicate 95% of so-called supernatural things that spiritualism said they could do and did do, and Houdini could duplicate it. Now, granted that 99 and 44, 100% is fraud. What about the rest? I believe that what happened here is supernatural, but I don't think God had a thing to do with it. Now, there's been another explanation that has been forthcoming, and that explanation, of course, is that the very desire of loved ones to want to communicate with those that have gone before. Now, I think that explains Sir Oliver Lodge and Sir Conan Doyle. They both had sons, you know, that were lost in the war, and they wanted to see them. And I believe even these men were taken in by it. And a great many are taken in that way today because they want to see. And when you want to see something... It's not very difficult to make you see it. Kipling wrote a poem that I think is the answer to this. Listen to this. The road to Endor is easy to tread for mother or yearning wife. There it is sure we shall meet our dead as they were even in life. Earth has not dreamed of the blessing in store for desolate hearts on the road to Endor. Whispers shall comfort us out of the dark Hands, ah, oh God, that we knew, visions and voices, look and hark, shall prove that our tale is true, and that those who have passed to the further shore may be hailed at a price on the road to Endor. Oh, the road to Endor is the oldest road and the craziest road of all. Straight it runs to the witch's abode as it did in the days of Saul. And nothing has changed of the sorrow in store for such as go down to the road to Endor. And so that is another explanation. Now there are those that say that the witch actually brought Samuel from the dead. I say to you that's not tenable or consistent with the rest of Scripture. We read here, Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me? Saul answered, I'm sore distressed, 
for the Philistines make war against me. He wanted an answer, you see. And he said God was not answering him. And actually, this was a familiar spirit. The ventriloquist, I think she was a fraud, but she was controlled and mastered by a divining demon. And really, she gave no new news. If you notice here, nothing new was advanced at this time. He'd already been told that God had rejected him. And already in 1 Samuel 15, 23, Samuel had said in his lifetime, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Well, God's already told him that. This was nothing new. The thing is that when this spirit here says, the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, that's not new at all. That was already known. And you have no new word at all. And we're told here in First Chronicles 10, verse 13, it says, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David the son of Jesse. May I say to you, God condemned this thing that he did and gave that as one of the explanations. And if you go over to the book of Job, you find that another man there, he came up with something. He was one of the friends of Job. And he says, now a thing was secretly brought to me in mine. He received a little thereof in thoughts from the vision of the night when deep sleep falleth on men. Fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice. And what in the world do you think is going to be said? When this man went through all of these gyrations and had this tremendous experience, what came out? Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Nothing new. The Spirit revealed nothing new. Fact of the matter is, what actually happened, I think, is this. An explanation that's helped by many able expositors of the world. God, not the witch, made Samuel appear. And, of course, they use verse 12, that actually it was God that did it. But I do not hold that. A false spirit appeared, and it was not Samuel. God no longer spoke to Saul. Worse still, Saul no longer spoke to God. And the dead cannot communicate with the living at all. And therefore, this was satanic from beginning to end, and nothing new was said at all. Now, when I say that the dead cannot communicate with the living, there's one exception. You want to listen to a voice from the dead? Well, listen to this. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believeth on me shall never die. That's the voice of one who died, my friend, and listen to him again. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying, Unto me fear not, I'm the first and the last. I am he that living, I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. And the reason God doesn't want you and me fooling with this sort of thing, and the reason that this is satanic to the very core is only one can speak to us who's been dead, and that's the one who's alive forevermore, the Lord Jesus. And he says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Samuel was not brought back from the dead. This was satanic and deceit 
from the very beginning to the very end. For resources that will help you go deeper in your own study of God's Word, visit ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. And join us next time for more in this wonderful journey through the Bible. grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.